And I'm going to start recording as well. Welcome folks. Um, we'll get started in just a minute or two. We want to give everyone a chance to join us today. We will be recording this webinar and uh, it'll be available um, to all those folks who pre-registered and you can feel free to email us as well to request a copy. We have disabled the chat for this webinar, so please use the Q&A if you have a question. Okay, it seems like we've plateaued on the number of participants joining us today. So um, since we're a minute or so after one o'clock, we'll go ahead and get started. My name is Alyssa Vinson and I am the residential horticulture agent for the Manatee County Extension Office. Um, if you are new to Extension, um, I just wanna briefly introduce who we are and talk a little bit about our impacts and then I'll hand it over for the presentation today. Uh, we are a function of the University of Florida, which is one of Florida's two land grant universities. And our mission is to take the research that's conducted at the University of Florida, as well as other land grant universities, and to, to bring that information down to our communities in a way that is accessible and applicable to their everyday lives, with the ultimate goal being to enhance the quality of human life within our communities. And so, so that's what we do. We span all kinds of program areas, everything from um, backyard vegetable gardening to commercial marine shellfish aquaculture to family and nutrition programs for kids um, in local schools. We have master money mentors program. We have the community gardens program. We have a livestock program. 4-H is housed in our office. So we really do span um, a wide variety of topics. Um, and within Manatee County in 2019, we saw over um, $2.2 million in the value of new licenses and CEUs provided uh, to those professional industries. Over $860,000 of value in volunteer time, and the majority of that comes from our Master Gardener volunteer program. Um, one of our Master Gardener volunteers is who you're going to be hearing from today. They provide valuable educational opportunities to our community. We also educated over 28,000 youth and saved over 14 million gallons of water to utilities customers. So you can see that while um, we may be kind of an obscure little office tucked away by the fair, um, we really do have a, have a wide ranging impact within the community. And I hope that you'll um, get a lot of value out of the presentation today. And I'm gonna go ahead and let Amy share her screen and get her presentation set up. Amy Stripe is one of our Master Gardener volunteers. She is our palm guru here in the office. <laughs> um, I ask Amy questions about palms when I have questions about palms. Um, so I know that she has a really great presentation ready for you today. So take it away, Amy. Thanks, Alyssa, and hello, everybody. Welcome. Um, I've been a Manatee County Master Gardener volunteer for the last 12 years, and I'm also a member of the International Palm Society, which if you're interested in learning more about that particular organization, you can access them at palms.org. That's P-A-L-M-S dot org. Lots of good information there. Uh, this is part one of a three-part uh, series of webinars, or as my friend and master gardener, fellow master gardener, Andrea calls it, 
pulmonars <laughs> on palms. Uh, today we're going to talk about palm biology and identifying different species. And then a week from today, we're going to cover palm care. Palm care will include how to plant palms, how to fertilize and prune them. And then part three, two weeks from today, is palm diseases, disorders, pest insects, and then kind of goofy things that palms normally do that look abnormal, but are perfectly normal. <laughs> so we begin today with um, palm biology because palm biology is really unique among ornamental plants. And knowing how they're structured helps us understand their cultural requirements a little bit better. Um, also, you know, basic to the, gra basic to the, the grasp of, of palm morphology is the, to be able to identify different species so that you can choose the one that is most appropriate for your particular landscape. The other key thing that is involved with like, species identification, however, when we get it into parts two and three of the webinar, are that there are host specific issues that um, occur. So in other words, there are certain diseases that only impact certain species of palms and knowing that will help you diagnose those issues. So I'd like to acknowledge Drs. Sidney Park Brown and Dr. Tim Brochot. A great deal of the information uh, in today's presentation is drawn from their presentations. They are unhappily for us now retired. I hope that they're enjoying their well-deserved retirement. Um, today's agenda, we're going to do some fun stuff to start out. There's a little quiz um, just to start us off. Then we'll talk about how palms are different from broadleaf trees. So this is so you can be the brain on your block. In other words, you can show off to your neighbors to say, hey, palm trees aren't really trees, you know, and explain why. And then we'll talk about a bit about palm construction or morphology. And then the heavy lifting part of the presentation, I have to admit, is going to be discussing some botany terminology to help you identify palms. Once you have that, that, that terminology under your belt, uh, we're going to cover some, of the palm, some examples of palm identification, and then we'll just look at pretty photos of palms. So this is your first question uh, of the day. This is a, there's a little, a little answer box that has come up now. You might have to move it around your screen so you can look at all six plants that I've showed you here. The question for you is which of these are palms? And they're labeled A, B, C, D, E, and F. You could also choose all of these, think all of these are palms or none of these are palms. And we'll um, cover off the results to that in, uh, in, a, in a few seconds, but um, I'll give you a few minutes. I'll take a drink of water. You guys look at this. Don't spend too much time on it. It's not that, not that big of a deal. <laughs> Okay, let me get that off the screen. There we go. Okay, here's some fun palm trivia. Um, the world of palms is full of superlatives. The biggest seed in the plant kingdom is a palm tree seed or palm seed. This is Coco de Mer palm, Laudicia maldivica. It is a native of the Seychelles. This chap on the right is actually holding one of those seeds. Um, they can weigh up to 50 pounds. And interesting enough that the, the palm itself does not get that big. It gets to be about 45 feet high. It's not a giant, um, but it's just for grins. I went on eBay this morning and I, I well, I, first I Googled this seed I, and I ended up with an eBay link. And this is like on eBay for upwards of a thousand bucks. Now, I don't know what you're gonna do with it. Maybe use it as doorstop, but anyway. Um, so that's, that's uh, Coco de Mera palm. The largest leaf in the plant kingdom is on the raffia palm. That's raffia regalis. It is a native of Africa. Um, just to point out, a single, uh, a frond on a palm is a single leaf. And you'll learn that here in a few minutes. But those leaves on the raffia palm can get up to 80 feet long. And the, and the palm itself is quite, quite tall. Quite, can also be up to 80 feet. The largest inflorescence in the plant kingdom is also on a palm. This is the tailpot palm, Corypha umbriculifera. I have no idea why it's called tailpot. I could find absolutely no, no information on that. Uh, the origin of this palm is not known. Uh, perhaps the Indian sub subcontinent, but this is the inflorescence here in this picture. This is the flower stalk or cluster, 25 feet high. When this palm gets to be about 45 to 50 years old, she produces her first and last uh, palm inflorescence and then she dies. 
here are some poems that you might not think are poems. This is the Likuela poem on the right. It's considered a, uh, a it's considered an undivided palm leaf because these little the spaces between these little segments are very very shallow. Um, but it is a palm. Now the clustering fishtail on the right has a unique uh, leaf type. It's a bipinnate leaf. Uh, very, very unusual amongst palms. In fact, limited only to the uh, Caryota tribe of palms. Uh, coincidentally, the fishtail palm, by the way, is also one that once it produces its inflorescence, it also dies. Uh, there's a name for that I can't pronounce, but anyway, that suffice it to know that, that that's what happens. It is a, uh, a fairly common palm in landscapes, at least here in central Florida. Another commonly named fishtail palm, the miniature fishtail, notice that the uh, genus is in no way related to the other fishtail palm we just saw, which is where common names drive me insane. But anyway, this you would look at this and not necessarily think that that's a palm, but it is. And then of course, our old faithful saw palmetto, which a lot of people think of as just a scrub shrub, is in fact a palm. So can we see the results of our little quiz? Wow, interesting. Okay, well, so 13% of you were correct. Oops. None of these are palms. Um, the screw palm or pine A is a, actually it is a, a monocot, but it is in an old world uh, family, large family of plants called the Panadacea, but it's neither a palm nor a pine, even though its common name is screw palm or pine. The ponytail palm is actually a succulent and it is uh, more related to an agave than anything else. The Panama hat plant has the word palm in its scientific name, but it is in fact a plant, it is fact, it is fact the plant from which um, Panama hats are made. And of course, Panama hats, you realize, aren't made in Panama at all. They're made in Ecuador, just to make it more confusing. Uh, the cardboard palm and the king sago palm are members of a, a large order of plants, the cycad order of plants. And they are neither monocots nor dicots. They are gymnosperms, uh, which means naked seed. They don't have any flowers, any fruit. Uh, their growing point is underground. Another favorite landscape member of this particular order is the Kunti, which is Zamia, for, uh, Zamia Floridana, I'm sorry, it's a native. Uh, lastly, there's the Traveler's Palm, more related to uh, Bird of Paradise than anything else. Now, just to make life even more interesting, there is actually a palm, a true palm, which has the common name Traveler's Palm, but it looks nothing like this, and it is actually Wallichia distica is the scientific name of the commonly named traveler's palm that is a palm. Confused? <laughs> I don't blame you. All right, so how are palms different? Palms are monocots, so they have more in common with the grass than with a true tree. Both grasses and palms are monocots. They have one seed leaf, one growing point. They are unbranched. There is no true wood or bark on palms. The veins on the leaflets, as you can see in this, the, uh, the little seedling here, are parallel. And most, in fact, I would say 99% can only be propagated from a seed. Um, seed germination is slow and uneven, so that's what makes certain palms more expensive than others. Uh, the vascular system is quite different on palm trees compared to hardwood trees. On hardwood trees, you have the outer, these are cross sections of trunks, obviously. You have the bark, the outer layer of bark on the, on the, uh, on the hardwood tree, followed by the cambium and phloem uh, layer. The phloem is the carbohydrate or the food, if you will, for the tree. It travels uh, uh, up and down. Then interior of that is the active xylem. Xylem is what transports water. It is unidirectional, only goes from the bottom up to the top. Now, as trees, as hardwood trees age, they add successive layers of cambium and phloem and active xylem, and that's what gives you your tree rings. In a palm, however, there is no true bark. It's called pseudo bark. And inside the central cylinder are bundles of xylem and phloem, and they lengthen as the trunk or stem lengthens on the palm. Um, 
I sort of picture them as like a fiber optic cable. They're just bundled in there together. Now they produce, there's no secondary growth of any of those tissues in a palm. So they only produce them once and done. The pseudobark, by the way, is actually dead tissue. So unlike a hardwood tree that adds diameter to the trunk every year, uh, a palm trunk or stem, as it's more accurately called, does not. The palm stem has to reach its maximum diameter before it starts going up the way. So you can see like on these coconut palms on the left, they've got a full head of hair, so to speak. I mean, they got a full canopy. And your Bismarck palm on the, on the right really demonstrates why you need to have an awfully big yard for this youngster, because you've got to have room for that full canopy um, before that trunk starts getting, you know, growing up and getting, getting that, that canopy out of the way. Uh, so trunks behave differently from hardwood trees in the sense that palm stem, stem wounds are permanent. So refrain from nailing Christmas tree lights on a palm, refrain from using um, climbing spikes, you know, to, to do any pruning. Uh, they really don't uh, like that kind of thing because as you saw, the phloem and xylem does not, does not grow new, 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 um, a new vascular system. So this is a, a palm on the, on, the, uh, on the left here where somebody has nailed up some sort of a notice or something like that and ripped it out. Now, what happens is I've seen cases where in holes in palm stems where the tissue, and I think it's probably just a function of, of gravity, where the tissue will kind of compress around the hole, but it never really, it's not growing anything new and it's never gonna be permanently closed. So that's obviously an open wound for infection, disease, pests, et cetera. Now, hardwood trees, on the other hand, you can see this. I love this picture, actually, on the right. I found this on YouTube. Uh, I think this was a hardwood tree that was staked with a piece of rebar, and oh, somebody like forgot to take it away. And so the, basically, the, the tree grew around it and looks like it bent it in half, too. So it's a pretty cool picture. Now, roots are different on palms. Roots on palms are entirely adventitious. Adventitious means that they are originating from an organ other than another root. So in the case of palms, it's usually the stem or the trunk where they originate. And those little, those little um, palm roots will are, go hook up to those, those uh, vascular cables, if you will, of xylem and phloem, and they continually reproduce reprodu new roots, these new roots. Sometimes you get a situation like on this uh, foxtail on the left, very, very commonly you see a flared, you see the, the pseudobark flaring out at the, at the base of that, about that palm because it's just gotten way enthusiastic in terms of developing, <laughs> developing its roots. The, uh, the phoenix species, the date palm over on your right, that just shows that the root initiation zone extended up the stem. It's perfectly normal. It's nothing wrong with the, with the, with the, uh, with the palm. Uh, those roots, I will have to say though, are dead roots because they have to be in contact with the soil to be living. Okay, palms are usually in our air, in our state, at least in, in, in Florida, are usually nutrient deficient. There's a number of reasons for that. Um, and that is because most, I would say, most of the palms that we use in our landscapes for ornamentals are not native. Um, that's for starters. And the other reason is because our soils typically are very poor in terms of nutrients. But the number one reason why palms in landscapes, maintained landscapes, are deficient is because of improper fertilization. And that's your teaser to watch next week. That's a really cool story to tell. I have to have a little disclaimer here. These pictures were taken of palms at the uh, University's Fort Lauderdale Research and Education Center. And these deficiencies were actually induced um, by scientists as part of an experiment. The sable palmetto is the cabbage palm on your left. That is a native palm. You will hardly ever, 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 ever see a nutrition deficiency on a sable palmetto. Um, on Phoenix Robolini, on the other hand, yeah, you're pretty much going to see that all every time. Okay, palm construction or morphology. So the terminology that's in parentheses is kind of our colloquial use of terms, and I admit I use them interchangeably. 
but the word that precedes the parentheses is really the correct terminology. So the stem is actually, uh, the trunk is actually a stem. And uh, you often see on, on, on palm stems, old uh, rings that are scar scars of old, where old leaves were. Um, there's all sorts of characteristics that are interesting about, about different species on, on palm stems. The lollipop at the top is called the crown. It's the canopy. The spear is, uh, is the newest emerged leaf, the newest emerged unfurled leaf, I should say. Now, a lot of times people will say to me, you know, Amy, you always say there's only one spear leaf, but you know what? Like on my foxtail, I, I'm only, I was always seeing three spear leaves. Well, what you're seeing actually is a newest leaf, that's the newest emerged leaf, and then you're seeing kind of a secondary and then a tertiary type of spear leaf. They're just, they're older leaves than the newest, they just haven't completely unfurled yet. Um, the apical meristem, this is the growing point of the palm, the bud or the heart. This is where all the new leaves are, are formed. If you were to cut it in two, you could see all these undeveloped new leaves in there. Really kind of cool to look at. But if the apical meristem gets uh, injured or say gets a, a insect pest or a disease or maybe a, a fungal rot or, of some sort and dies, the entire uh, plant will die. That is really the um, the end of the, of the plant if the apical meristem is not alive. If it gets damaged but still is, but survives, you might see uh, leaves that come out looking funny, like damaged, um, until it can until newer leaves can develop and come out normally. Now the frond, uh, this is one leaf. This thing that we call a frond is one leaf, and those little green things are leaflets on feather type palms. On fan palms, they're, they're called segments. And then of course you have your root initiation zone um, down here. Now roots on palms, uh, there's a lot, there's a few kind of anchor roots, but there's a lot of little feeder roots and they can extend out quite a ways from the base there. They can go out as far as maybe 40 or 50 feet, which has uh, real implications about fertilization, which another teaser for next week. Um, hadn't thought about that. But um, the other thing to know is that the uh, roots of palms will never, I shouldn't say never, but I've never seen an instance where roots will do things like oak tree roots do, like, you know, damage side, you know, pull up sidewalks or, you know, buckle a, a, a driveway or something like that. The roots on palms are just ve are very, very fine. Um, so I've never seen a case where a palm root has, has done any damage to a structure. Now further on the palm leaf or frond, um, it has the, the, the green leafy part is called the blade or lamina. So I think of it like a blade of grass, you know, this is the blade. This, which we want to call a stem, but is not because we know the stem is actually the trunk. This is called a petiole. And then at the base here of the leaf, sometimes it's a sheath. If it's, a, if it's coming off of a smooth crown shaft, for example, it might be a sheath. Um, if a portion of this is left behind on the trunk or the stem of the palm, it is called a boot in some cases. So, all right, here's the heavy lifting section, get ready. There are five leaf characteristics we're going to look at for uh, palm identification. The trunk, again, which is really the stem, uh, spines or teeth, color of the foliage, and then flowers and fruits. So first characteristic of the leaf, what is it shaped like? Does it look like a feather? Does it look like a fan? Pretty simple, right? So the feather, the feather type shape has leaflets. These are leaflets. On a fan-like shape, these are called segments. More on this later. And now, yes, okay, so leaf type. So we have three main leaf types. I remember I said on the fishtail there's a bipinnate. We're not going to cover that one today. We're going to cover these. This is 98% of all palms are one of these three types of leaves. So pinnate is, um, is the one on your far left. Uh, it has a petiole. When the petiole comes into the blade here, it now is called a rachis. So it's kind of like a midrib thing, but it actually is called a rachis. And then these are leaflets. Now of the fan-like palms, there are two separate leaf types. There is the palmate, like the palm of your hand, and there's the costa palmate. In the palmate, it has a petiole, 
but it stops right here at the blade, at the beginning of the blade. And then these are called segments, not leaflets, they're called segments. And the space between them is called a sinus, so like a void. Now, costa palmate also has a petiole, but the petiole, as it, as it comes into the blade, is called a costa, has a costa. Costa means rib. And it kind of divides this whole blade into two halves. Again, it has segments, it has sinuses also. So just to review again, pinnate, feather-like, individual leaflets attached to this mid-rib rachis, and the rachis is the part of the petiole that extends into the leaflets. This is a palmate leaf, so it's fan-like. Again, it has segments. Um, it has a petiole. Sometimes in some species where the petiole comes into and meets the blade, it forms something called, a, it's, like a, it's like a little belly button. It's, like, it's like called a hastula. And it's very prominent on some species. It's kind of cool. Like this one, this is a thatch palm. Okay, um, this is a costa palmate. So again, this is, has to be, this is a cabbage palm. You can see clearly where this is the, um, this is the petiole where it comes into the blade now. It's got a rib called a costa. And it tends to be more elongated, uh, the costa palmate versus the, the blade versus the, um, versus the palmate. Okay, third, third characteristic of leaves is the type of base. So there are basically two. There are palms that have what we call a crown shaft, that has that smooth, smooth crown shaft, like on that royal palm on the left, and there are some that have no crown shaft. Now, the crown shaft is uh, only on feather palms, only on feather palms, but oops, but not all feather palms have crown shafts. Okay, just, so this is a royal palm. We call it self-cleaning because when this leaf dies, it naturally falls off on its own. So it's self-cleaner, but the poor old no crown shaft palm is a you cleaning. So when this leaf dies, you either have to physically cut it off yourself if you don't want to have it left on there, or you can wait for maybe a, a wind event or something to maybe take it away. Okay, fourth characteristic of leaves. This is the, um, this is the induplicate or reduplicate nature of the leaflets or the segments. This is how they attach. This is the pleat or the fold where the leaflets or segments attach. So induplicate leaflets or segments are folded upward where they attach to the petiole, like a V. And that's in most, I'm gonna show you pictures of this in a second, so don't freak out. Um, that's like most fan palms are induplicate. Reduplicate leaves are folded downward where they attach to the rachis, it's on most feather palms. There's a big, big exception to this feather palm reduplicate rule, which we're gonna see later on in the presentation. So our mnemonic is V is the valley that catches the rain, that's the induplicate. Reduplicate, the rain runs off the roof. And here's what it looks like. So now you're looking down at the top of the leaf, not the underside of the leaf, but the top of the leaf. So in this, um, in this thatch palm, you can clearly see these are the segments. Okay, these are the sinuses. You can clearly see where the fold is like this. See how the fold is like a V, like a V. The valley catches the rain. On this queen palm on the right, it is reduplicate. You can see, again, clearly where that leaflet is attached like this to the rachis. It's pointing, it's pointing down, it's pointing down the way. So the, the rain runs off the roof. All right, the very last uh, leaf characters we're gonna look at is on fan palms only. And this is like describing the type of segment that it is. So is it deeply divided or is it, or is it divided at all? Like on that uh, Licuela palm, that's considered undivided. But on this lady palm, you can see these are very deep divides between the segments. Um, it also, on this lady palm, has very fine teeth along the margins, along the edges of these um, segments. And then it's also deeply ribbed. That's another characteristic. Um, does the, do these segments droop at the tips? You might look at this at, just at a glance and go, wait, Amy, that looks like a feather palm. No, 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 see, look, it's a fan palm. It's just got deeply divided segments and they are now forming this little fringe at the, at the tips. This is a Chinese fan palm. You might also see these little thread type things. These are bits of tissue 
that were on leaf margins before this um, fan palm, before this leaf unfurled, and they are sometimes they stay on like forever on on uh, cabbage palms. It's very characteristic for them to stay on for a long time. Trunk type. Okay, we're moving away from leaves now. Whew, got that behind us. Now let's look at trunks. Pretty simple, right? Single or multi trunk. So this uh, this is a Chilean wine palm. Isn't that a gorgeous thing? That's very clearly one trunk or one stem. The multi trunk. This is the parotis palm. This has basically it has meristems on its roots that shoot up all these new um, new stems. So that is a single individual right there. Not that. Not that fast, it can get tricky though. These are all individual plants you're looking at here. So the Adenina morelli, a lot of people think is a clusterer or a clumper, no it's not. These are, this is done in the nursery. Um, these are three individual uh, palms that they have planted together for the simple reason that it looks better in the landscape, it's aesthetic. Um, a single one of these guys, this is the Christmas palm. They, they're, they're very skinny trunk, they kind of look funky on their own. But I can almost guarantee you that in about 50% of the cases when they do this, you're gonna lose one or more of those, uh, of those, um, those stems. The reason is because, we don't, know, well, we don't know what the reason is. It could be root competition or you know, who knows. But it's very, very common for, for, for one or more individual to, to, uh, to, to bite the dust here um, when they do those types of things. Now the palm on your right is a parlor palm. Those are all individual palms. It just happened to have self-sown like crazy. Okay, spines or teeth. Now, where are they? So spines or teeth are either modified rachises, modified leaflets. Sometimes they're just um, uh, tissue, uh, bits of fiber um, that emerge like from the trunk and fiber projections. So this rapidophyllum hystrix, that is, that's our native needle palm. It's considered trunkless. Um, boy, we want to get it. Anywhere near that thing. <laughs> the palm in the middle is called the Gru Gru palm, and those are basically fiber projections coming out of the trunk. And then this is a European fan palm on the far right. Those are very sharp teeth. They are pointing up, if you'll notice, on the petiole. The Chinese fan palm has very, very similar looking um, teeth, but they point either straight out or down. So you can see how those characteristics are kind of key for identifying different species. And then, okay, the foliage color, is it green like this lady palm up here? Um, is it, uh, does it be yellow green like our, this is an areca palm down here uh, on the lower right. They tend to have yellow characteristics when they're in full sun. Or is it a blue green or what we call silver? This is actually a saw palmetto called silver saw palmetto. Um, it is a natural variety, natural occurring variety, uh, and I believe I read somewhere that it was endemic to Manatee County, but don't quote me. I'm not sure where I got that information from, but they're beautiful. I have, I have some of those in my yard. I love them. So flowers and fruits. Um, flowers and fruits aren't always a particularly useful clue because the palm's not always going to be in flowers or fruits, and the fruits typically will change color. Um, before they get, become mature. So it's kind of a tricky one, but um, there's a couple things to know. Most, uh, most palms have unisexual flowers, meaning they have separate male and female flowers. They can be either dioecious or monoecious, meaning dioecious means that there is a, a, a separate male and female palm. Monoecious means both sexes on one palm. Uh, the large, there's a large number of individual flowers that make up the inflorescence. They can be long and branched, and they can be classified to where they originate in the canopy. So here's our good old tailpot back again. This is called suprafoliar. The flowers and fruits stand above the canopy. Here is interfoliar. This is where uh, the inflorescence occurs within the canopy. Now, this is a phoenix uh, or canary and date palm, and typically people tend to cut off the inflorescence because they're, they are messy. And sometimes you will, it does goofy looking things to the tree. If they cut that inflorescence out, there's a big gap between the newer leaves at the top of the crown and the lower leaves at the bottom of the crown. Lastly, we have infrafoliar. This is mostly crown chap palms where it is below the canopy. Okay, next, next quiz. This is tricky. We're gonna see how many of you were really observant on those pictures. You'll have to scroll down to answer number three.
Okay. Do we have results? Still waiting on results, Amy. Okay. Yeah, nobody has responded yet. Uh oh. Maybe I put everybody to sleep. Okay, well, we'll move on. So the answer to number, the first question is the technical term for a frond is a leaf. An example of a feather palm is actually going to be the pygmy date palm. And in duplicate means that you have an upward V on where the, uh, where the, where the segment or leaflet uh, attaches to the midrib or petiole. Um, I'm gonna go through some specific palms right now uh, using our little tool chest of morphology terminology. But before I do, I just wanna uh, cover off a couple of reminders that we will see that palms will be classified um, with a cold hardiness zone. So that means that this is the ability of a palm to survive at that average annual min mi extreme minimum temperature. I really hate when they make these things so close in color that you can hardly tell them apart. But, and I apologize to panhandle people, um, but I believe that this is 8B, this is 9A, whoops, this is 9A, this is 9B, this is 10A here, this is going to be 10, I'm sorry, 10A, 10B, and this is gonna be 11A and 11B. So just a, a reminder that you certainly don't want, if you have a palm that's classified as either, either like 11 or let's say it says it's good cold hardy 10 to 11, you certainly don't wanna plant it in nine or certainly not eight. Um, lastly, you'll see that a couple of these palms will have little warning labels on them. Uh, for invasive or caution. This refers to the university's assessment of non-native plants. Uh, this is a program whereby the university assesses, I think there's over 900 plants now in the assessment. They assess them for, uh, for their uh, risk of being invasive. So invasive is defined as a naturalized species, an exotic that has become naturalized, i.e. escape cultivation is expanding in the wild, displacing native species and altering the ecology of natural communities. A non-native is an exotic likely to cause environmental or economic harm or harm to human health, okay? A caution is a non-native species that is exotic at moderate risk of becoming invasive and must be managed to prevent escape from cultivation. Again, cultivation is kind of what we control. Uh, they further go to uh, assess each one of these species as whether, uh, so their invasiveness in North, Central, and South Florida. So there might be a plant that is invasive in South Florida, but is not a problem in North Florida, probably due to climactic conditions. But anyway, and you can, uh, you can access that uh, assessment at this URL here, and it's got great pictures, great information, um, good to know. Okay, we're gonna go through some common fan palms in Florida. By the way, by common, we don't mean recommended because I just showed you we've got, we've got some that are gonna be caution or invasive. Um, this is the Perotus or Everglades palm. It is a native. It's a lovely screening palm. It is a palmate leaf type. It is in duplicate. <laughs> Rigid yellow green fronds. It is multi-trunked or clustering. Again, it does have, and a lot of people call them suckers, whatever, but they're, it's multi-stemmed. It's multi Okay, the trunks are tall, thin, covered with fiber. The teeth are orange on the petiole. These teeth are often paired and point up. And there are fruits, the fruits are orange. They mature to black in December. 25 to 30 feet high. It is, a, like I said, a Florida native, 9B to 11. Can handle some, can handle some shade, but by the time it gets to its mature size, it's gonna, it's gonna be in the sun, so. Um, it does have problems with manganese deficiency, and it can kill this palm uh, if it gets a bad enough manganese deficiency. That's because people use it a lot in, um, in medians or parking lots or in uh, developments, you know, where there's, where there's a lot of limestoney soil, and it really doesn't like limestoney soil. Um, so that's why I have seen this palm fail in situations like that, um, which you wouldn't think because it's a native, but remember it's called Everglades palm. So it comes from a lot, uh, it's native soil is a lot, a lot nicer than what we typically put it into. 
Here's the cabbage palm. This is our state tree, which always cracks me up. Uh, sometimes called the sable palm. It's the source of swamp cabbage. That's hearts of palm. That's where that comes from. I originally thought that it was called swamp cabbage or cabbage palm because of the shape of the of the uh, canopy, but actually, I guess it's the taste of the hearts of palm. They taste like cabbage or something like that. Kathy can tell you the story on that one. Anyway. Um, so this is a Costa palmate. It has that mid rib. It is in duplicate uh, segments, single trunk to the trunks. Uh, I will show pictures of this in a minute. The trunk is covered with leaf faces or boots or can be smooth. Now these, of course, are all genetically individuals. They're all, they all grow from seed. So they're all going to be different. So sometimes they retain their boots and sometimes they don't. It's just however, however it was genetically um, engineered or designed, I should say. Uh, smooth petiole, no, leaf, no teeth. There are threads in the sinuses, green or gray green fronds. And then they have black, brown black fruits that are quarter of an inch and shiny. So there you can clearly see those threads and look at those boots. I personally like the look of those boots. To me, that's a real nice Florida look. But some people don't like them and you can take them off. That's not a problem. And once you've done with that, you can come weed in my yard. <laughs> okay, so 20 to 40 feet high. Okay, the literature says up to 90. I've never seen one that high, but I suppose it's possible in the right conditions. Um, it is native, uh, nine to 11 zones, warmer parts of eight, full sun to part shade. We have a tremendous problem now uh, in, in at least in central Florida, I should say central and south Florida, with lethal bronzing disease on our cabbage palms. And that will be covered off in um, part three of the, of the pulmonar. <laughs> uh, the last one I'm gonna go through is the Chinese fan palm. This is Lipstona chinensis. This is a really lovely uh, palm. It, it however, is uh, on the caution, is, on a, is a caution invasive for North Central and South Florida. Uh, the, the leaf type is Costa palmate. It is in duplicate single trunked. The trunk, it's rings on it when it's young. You see this leaf scar is really visible. I'll show you a picture. That's a young one. You can see those, those ringed leaf scars right here. Whereas on the mature one, not so much. Just wear and tear. Um, there are teeth. These teeth point down and out. Remember European fan, they point up. Light green prawns and the fruits are blue green and year round. They get this beautiful uh, fringe, like we, sh we saw earlier, um, on the tips when they when the uh, leaves become mature. 30 feet high, 15 feet wide, native of uh, Asia, 9B to 11, full sun to part shade, pest free. Too bad it's on the caution list. Okay, so now here's just some other palms that we see commonly. This is the lady palm. She's a smaller palm gets to be at eight to 10 feet. She's a, a clumper. Um, she, it will get chlorotic in full sun. You'll see her turning kind of yellow in full sun. She really prefers the shade. Um, because it's a smaller palm, I often see it in front of homes. In full sun, it doesn't look great. This is the Bismarck palm. Um, this palm is uh, absolutely beautiful. It is, also comes in a green form, but people of course prefer the silver. It's just a much more interesting look. Uh, when you plant this palm, they recommend that you wait to plant one of these until it has developed a bit of a, of a, of a stem or trunk on it because that means it has a better root structure. The reason for that is because of windage. Those, those uh, particular leaves will just catch the wind like crazy. They're like big sails because um, they are quite huge. <laughs> so. Um, you need a big yard for this guy. This guy can get up to, uh, up to 60 feet tall. Here's the Mexican fan palm. This is a caution in South Florida. Um, this is likely to be the tallest palm you see in your landscape, at least here in Central Florida. Maybe in South Florida, you're likely, the royal palm might be the tallest one you see, but here, this one in Central Florida, this thing gets out of proportion very quickly. Um, it, is, it can get up to 80 feet tall. And what happens with the Mexican fan palm is when it gets to be about, I would say, well, maybe about 30 feet tall, it starts shedding its fronds and its boots. So it's almost like a self cleaner, um, but it will you know, get, get a good gust of wind and it will take off lots of dead fronds, which is kind of convenient because you can't exactly get up there to, uh, to prune off the dead ones if you don't like the look. 
Um, it does also have little teeth on the petiole, not always, not always. Um, sometimes if uh, there are nutritional uh, circumstances that are not great, it may not develop teeth, but um, I've got a couple of these that volunteered in my yard. In fact, the one on the left is in my yard. And uh, look at all those fronds that are <laughs> falling off down around it. It has teeth. All right, here is the saw palmetto serenoa repens. There's the silver form, we talked about that. This is a clumper. Um, I think a lot of you know that in homeopathic medicine, they use the, the, uh, the fruit of, of, this, of this for prostate health, I believe. Um, I was just looking into that the other day. And of course, you cannot harvest those fruits in the wild. You need a USDA license or permit. Um, even if I allowed you to come on my property and harvest them from my, my, my own plants, you would need a permit. Now, I can harvest them off of mine, but you can't if you come in my yard without that permit. Kind of interesting. This is the windmill palm, Trichycarpus fortunae. I love this palm. It is very underutilized. Um, see how when they become more mature, they develop this little fringe similar to that Chinese fan palm on their leaves. They have this really great hairy trunk on them, a whorled kind of habit of growth in the canopy there. Very cold hardy. Love it. Very underutilized palm. The European fan palm, you're more likely to see this than this because it grows so slow. This is ideal for containers, uh, big containers, obviously, but it's a very, very slow grower. Believe it or not, it is a clumper. This is a single palm here. Uh, there, there is a form of it, however, that is a single trunk. Um, but I know this particular picture is a clump because you can see more coming up here. Okay. Uh, these teeth curve up. The Florida thatch palm, this is a beautiful native palm. Uh, also has a pronounced hastula here tends to be yellow, tends to have a yellow cast to it. It's not malnutrition, it's just the way it comes. All right, let's look at some common feather palms here. Uh, we'll walk through again our toolbox of, of terminology for a couple or three of these. This is the queen palm. This palm is completely overutilized. Developers love it because it is inexpensive and it grows quite quickly. Um, it's often confused with the foxtail, which we're gonna cover next. And by the way, never do what this chap is doing over here. We call that volcano mulching. You need to leave a little bit of, a little bit of bare ground here for some gas exchange with roots. I mean, that can really kind of suffocate your roots there. So uh, this is pinnate, so feather-like. It is reduplicate attachment, single trunk. The trunk is gray smooth. It has ring scars around it. Uh, no teeth or spines, medium to dark green, yellow fruits, which are edible, by the way. And it is um, on the caution list for North, Central, and South Florida. And the reason why is because this self sows like crazy, like crazy. It's kind of what we call a weedy plant. 25 feet high, sometimes up to 40 if you feed it well. Uh, Native of South America, 9B to 11, the zones, full sun. This is a poster child of palm problems. It has its own flavor of Fusarium wilt, which is a uh, fatal disease of palms, of queen palms and magnesium, or Mexican fan palms, I'm sorry. It frequently shows the potassium, or manganese and potassium deficiencies. We call that frizzle top. It has a picture of it there on the lower middle here. And uh, it, like I said, it readily self sows. Here's the foxtail. So you can see the difference. Well, first of all, those of you who have been, uh, who have gone, you know, learned everything we've taught so far, realize that this is a self cleaner and this one is not. This has no crown shaft. So this um, is a self cleaning. And in fact, it's done, it's done us a favor here. And you can see it's already dropped a dead front here just for us to see. This is pinate reduplicate attachment. The leaflets are whorled around the rachis. So it's a, it's a lot, it looks like a fox's tail. <laughs> um, it has distinctive rings around the trunk, the crown shaft, the fruits are uh, red and about three feet long. It's supposed to be dark green. Uh, any of you who sat in on Stephen Brown's uh, presentation a couple weeks ago on palms know that he does not like this palm. 
So I sent him an email. I said, why don't you like this poem? He goes, it's never green. <laughs> and that's true. So those are the distinctive ring scars on the trunk. And the fruit looks like that when it's mature. Up to 40 feet high, native to Australia. So here's why. This comes from Queensland. This, they, they completely different soil from ours. I have rarely seen a foxtail in Florida that is completely green, including the three I have in my own yard, and I know how to fertilize them. Um, it's just a tough, tough nut, but they're beautiful. They're, they're relatively pest free. So 10A to 11 and full sun. And again, hot, heavy, heavy feeders, high fertilizer needs. The last of the palms we're gonna go through uh, in detail, this is the uh, areca palm. What you see here on the left is how somebody has really tidied it up, looks nice and neat. It's a clumper. What you see on the, on the right is mine. <laughs> I'm not gonna get in there and clean that thing out. So it is pinnate, it's a feather-like feather uh, uh, leaf. It is reduplicate, has a crown shaft, meaning it's self-cleaning. It is a clumper. It has a yellow to orange rachis, very distinctive. The yellowing of the leaves is normal, especially in full sun. And it, uh, there'll be multiple clusters of yellow orange fruits. It is on the caution list of plants for South Florida. 35 feet high by 20 feet wide is kind of typical. I just, uh, a couple years ago, my neighbor planted a bunch of these around his pool to, for screening and he planted them about six feet apart and he's now pulling them out because they spread quite wide, <laughs> overplanted. Uh, Native of Madagascar zones 10B to 11, uh, full sun to partial shade, does get Ganoderma butt rot, which is a lethal fungal disease of palms, and we'll discuss that in part three, but there's a reason for that, and it's because of these multi-trunks um, and how people sometimes prune them. Potassium deficiency is also an issue with Arikas. All right, so here's just some other feather palms that we like to see in our landscapes. This is the Adenidia or Manila or Christmas palm. It's got lots of names. Again, it is not a clumper. It is just planted as though it were in multiples. It's a, it's a smaller palm and it does in fact um, get to be about 15 to 25 feet high, but it's very distinctive because it has a very strongly curved rachis here. See how strong that curve is? Whoops, sorry, I keep doing that. And it has a much wider leaflet than a palm, than other palms its size. So that's kind of distinctive of that one. The royal palm, this is a native. Um, this guy gets to be from 60 to 90 feet tall. Characteristically does, has this trunk kind of that flares out and back in again. That's a very characteristic thing about it. The, uh, you don't want to plant this near walkways or driveways because it is a self cleaner. And a single one of those fronds can weigh up to about 30 pounds. Um, yeah, that's, that's a lot. Here's the cat palm, Camadoria cat cataractorum, which is for some reason taking on, it's been very popular recently. I think it's trying to, they're trying to find a substitute for the, uh, the Dipsis lutescens, the areca, because that gets so tall. This thing is considered trunkless and probably gets about eight feet tall. It's a clumper. Um, it likes it shadier. And um, in fact, it's kind of cold sensitive. So uh, you got to kind of watch that one. I have a neighbor that put this in uh, as a screener right on the edge of the bay. It's getting salt damage. It's getting sunburn. They don't look good. All right, this is probably the most recognizable palm in the world, Cocos nucifera, the coconut palm. There are tons of varieties of it. There's, um, it's, it's very, very important commercially. The chief crop is uh, copra, which is, which is coconut oil. Uh, it is on the invasive, it's considered invasive in South Florida. It's a caution in, in Central Florida. I don't know why people would plant them in, in circumstances like this, where you're next to kind of a driveway, because once this gets tall enough, you're not gonna be able to reach those coconuts yourself. You're gonna have to wait for them to fall down. And um, you can imagine. Um, I used to live in Miami and I remember vividly um, I used to go running every morning and one morning uh, I was out running and ran into a fellow runner and she said, did you hear about so-and-so? I said, what? She goes, she got killed by a coconut fall on her head out running. So from then on, I was kind of like, <laughs> no kidding. All right, let's talk about date palms. Um, there's many date palms that we use in our landscapes here. 
They have some common characteristics. Firstly, they're not self cleaners. They have no crown shaft. Now here is the big, big exception to the pinnate or feather type of uh, palm. These are in duplicate, not reduplicate like most of those other pinnates. This is in duplicate. They have sharp spines and boy, are they nasty on the petiole. And then their leaves in, in a single, single leaflet. So you can see it's a pair, there's a pair, there's a pair, but then there's a single leaflet at the tip. They are dioecious, meaning separate, sex, separate sexes on each tree. And the fruit is edible. Now, not all of the fruit is as edible as one another, if that makes sense. In other words, some taste a lot better than others. So here's this, uh, the Canary Island date palm. This, um, unfortunately, is another poster child of palm problems. Um, this is getting hammered by lethal bronzing disease, by uh, the palmetto weevil. It often, if not always, has nutritional deficiencies. It has a fusarium wilt that's all its own. Um, so this is a, a really expensive tree to put in your landscape and have it to fail. So keep that in mind if you select this for your landscape. Now this picture up here on the right, this is why, where it, by it gets its other common name, which is pineapple palm. But this is just, this, this, this particular crown has just been bundled up like this for transportation for purposes of planting. And they'll take that off when they put it in the ground. All right, so here's the pygmy date, it has this very distinctive knobs on the trunk. This is another one of those guys that they love to plant in, in groups. So I can almost guarantee you there were three originally in this picture on the right, and now one has died. Um, this palm gets under a lot of stress because of its size. People like to put it in like pool cages or near foundations or front doors of, of, of homes and things. Not necess all necessarily really healthy environments um, to, to grow in. So uh, this is the Senegal date palm. This is Phoenix reclinata. This is a clumber. This is considered invasive in South Florida. I have one of these that just popped up in my yard, just all by itself, don't know where it came from, uh, but there it is. And so this palm is about 40 to 50 feet high, can get up to 40 feet wide. The wild date palm, this is Phoenix sylvestris. The really distinctive characteristic of this is the, those are the leaf uh, bases there that you can see in the picture on the left. And when you first cut those dead leaves off, uh, it leaves an orange kind of coloration on the top of those leaf bases, kind of very, very distinctive. And then you can see what it looks like, um, the, you know, the full, full canopy of a full crown over here. This is the edible date palm. This is the medjool date palm. This is the one that you actually, um, that dates actually come from, the edible dates come from. Um, Phoenix dactylifera. Um, believe it or not, this is a clumping palm. But what happens is that people typically cut off, uh, if it's suckers or you know, creates new, new uh, stems, people typically cut them off because they like to have them in settings like this. Uh, you know, this is a very manicured setting. They don't want a clumper there. And then of course in commercial settings where they grow them for the dates, they also do not want clumpers because they need to be able to get to the fruit. All right, those are the date palms. Uh, here's a pindo palm. This is one of my favorites, underutilized Vita odorata. Beautiful, it's cold hardy, beautiful feathery, um, beautiful feathery leaves and beautiful, interesting trunk on that one. One of my favorites on there. Lastly is the Carpentaria palm. This is very common in South Florida. Um, it, the way I can sort of tell it apart from some of the other palms that look similar is these are leaflets taken from the rachis starting right. This is where the petiole comes in. Here's the beginning of the rachis. This is the very tip of the leaf. And you can see how they get these raggedy ends. It's called preamors. Um, as it progresses down, to, you know, to the, to the apical, you know, the apex of the leaf. All right, so people ask me about native palms. Uh, not a lot of choices, really, of native Florida palms. There's the Perotus palm, there's Buccaneer, the Needle Palm Royal, various sables, not all of which are commercially available. Uh, the Serenelle Repens, of course, and then the various thatch palms. If you want to get more information about these, you can go to the Florida Department of um, Agriculture and Consumer Services. They have a circular, just Google. FDAC Circular Native Palms of Florida. That's the easiest way to find that. 
And then if you want to get a good look at good variety of palms up close and personal, oh no, let me just say, sorry, sorry, jumped ahead here. This is an excellent website. This is a um, joint website between the university, the USDA, FDAX, and it covers about, I would guess that there's probably about uh, well over 100 palms on this. You go to the fact sheets that's got the individual, will have the individual palms. Unfortunately, it is by, by scientific name. Um, I just say that because there's no way to cross index with common name. But then there's a great, all that morphology I just covered is all explained really well there. They've got great pictures. It is a super, super tool. I go there by Googling palms ID but this is the actual um, URL proper. So, okay, again, up close and personal to look at palms. Here in, uh, in Central Florida, there's the Gisela Kopsic Palm Arboretum. It's in St. Petersburg. It's on the beach. It is a fabulous setting. The parking is free. There's plenty of it. There's no admission. There are a ton of palm species as well as cycads, a lot of cycads in this particular um, this arboretum and it's excellent. And then lastly, of course, is Fairchild down in, uh, down in Miami. They also have extensive palm species there. Lastly, please join me next week for Palm Care. That's all I have. All right, well, thanks, Amy, for that. That was another great presentation. Um, if anybody has any questions for Amy, if you want to go ahead and we can put them in the Q&A here. <laughs> uh, no, went super fast. I'm sorry, I was trying to keep it under an hour. <laughs> no, no, that's great, that's great. Um, did you want me to go back and show people the answers to that um, uh, last poll that we did? Yeah, I would, I'm curious. Okay. <clears throat> that's more for my benefit than anybody else's. So yeah, I just thought right. uh, we had some folks that were able to go in and and continue answering it. So excellent. Uh, okay, so not a not 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 a bad. Okay, not bad. <clears throat> yeah, good good on you guys who caught the pygmy date because um, I didn't label it pygmy date. I just said I just said it was a pygmy date when I got to that section. So so good for you. All right. Let's see. Um, a question on diamond cutting the boots of some palms, and is that purely ornamental, and does it harm the palm? If the leaf is completely dead, uh, it does not. But if the leaf is live, you're cutting into live tissue. The answer is yes. You can. Um, two things can happen. You can set up a, a, a open area for infection, or you can um, also. Uh, impact the nutrient, uh, the nutrients that are available to that palm. Mm -hmm. All right. If there are no other questions, we'll go ahead and end the webinar today. Again, this was recorded, so um, we'll be sending out the recording to everybody that registered for the presentation. And then if you um, know of somebody who would be interested in it and you'd like to request a copy of it for them, um, just go ahead and send us an email. And in the meantime, if you have any questions about landscape issues, feel free to email um, manatee.mg at gmail.com. And that will come to our general kind of plant clinic inquiry email box so we can help you out with all of your gardening questions, um, even though our offices are still not open to the public at this time. So again, thank you all today uh, for joining us. And we look forward to seeing you again in the next installment of the Palminar. <laughs> <laughs> Palminar.